this talk today have really set the scene for this talk. So there's a lot of topics I probably don't need to introduce because I probably tried to cram a little bit too much into 20 minutes, but maybe we'll just catch up a little because of that. Glo global hydropower production, well, renewable energy cover covers about 20% of the total global energy demand today in the world. And a hydropower actually makes up more than 80% of this renewable energy. So it's a substantial energy resource being used at the present. And it's a, an area of rapid expansion. And currently, there are more than 3,000 developments of very large schemes. So that's more than 15 megawatts um, um, capacity under construction. And a large part, of, large part of that has actually been driven by um, some of the, 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 the climate, um, <clears throat> the United Nations climate control deal in, in Paris, where um, by 2020, the aim is to find 100 million, a billion, 100 billion dollars a year towards finding renewable energy in the developing world. So what they're trying to do is, they know that the developing countries, they're going to have a higher energy de demand in the future, and to try and not have impacts on, on the climate by that, they're trying to offset that by, <clears throat> by producing more renewable energy. And a lot of that will come from hydropower. <clears throat> well, it's been well established with uh, these classic hydropower dams that there are significant effects on the ecology of the, the ecosystem that they sit within. They regulate the, the discharge stream to a large degree. Temperature can also be hugely affected. Sediment transport and habitat. But the thing that's probably most important for, for, for the topic that we're here to dis discuss today is how they affect the connectivity of the systems. Well, migrating species will obviously find a dam like the one in the picture here a little bit difficult to negotiate. And in the perspective of Samanids, we, there has been sort of considerable work uh, done, particularly in trying to mitigate the effect of upstream migration of adults, but maybe less so as been noticed by other speakers on the downstream migration of the smolts, even though that's just an imp as important part of the life cycle. <clears throat> if we focus on the smolt, as we're here to do, uh, well, there are some classic reported effects, and there are direct effects, and that can be that simply the migration path is blocked, or they might have to go through the turbine. And here, the direct effects can be injury, and they can be caused by a number of things, uh, depending on what type of turbine we've got here. It could be pressure cha changes within, it could be changes in shear stress within, or it can be pure mechanical damage, as you see in these two smolts here. However, as other speakers have alluded to, there can also be a indirect effects, and these can be in terms of delayed migration, smolt window, we've talked about a lot, but also they might create um, extra opportunities for, for predators that are naturally present in the, in the catchment. <clears throat> so maybe the future isn't so bright for some of the, the big rivers in the developing countries uh, where there's lots of mig migratory species of fish, but maybe there's less focus on them. Oh, here we're here to speak about salmon. And definitely in the UK, there has also been a huge development in terms of hydro uh, power stations. In fact, they have more than quadrupled, quadrupled since 95. But if you take a closer look at the graph here, then you'll see that the, see if this thing works, uh, the gray line, that's the, that's the big plants, that's the big plants. They, there hasn't been that much change in them. It's primarily the small ones in the blue. They've gone from 95, there's less than 50 of them, and now in 2016 there was there was over 600 of them, so a rapid explosion in that, partly driven by feed-in tariffs uh, provided to people that put up these things, basically being paid over the odds for the electricity that they produce. But, of course, this is a renewable energy source, so maybe it's worth tapping into. But the thing with these low-head schemes that these, this, the small production tend to be is that they don't produce that much energy. And in fact, the Environment Agency identified more than 25,000 sites of where there are ex existing weirs that's producing a low head across England and Wales. So that's just England and Wales. 
So they are potential sites for these low head um, hydro turbines. If we look at the renewable energy um, generation within the UK, then you can see there's been an explosive growth in it over the last 10 years. But if I can draw your attention to the red or terracotta colored here, then you'll see they haven't actually, which is the hydropower part of it, they haven't actually increased that much. Of course, weather impacts these renewable uh, energy sources tremendously. So if there's not a lot of rain, you're not going to generate a lot of hydropower. And if there's not a lot of wind, you're not going to do a lot of wind generation. But they currently, the hydropower accounts for about 7.5% of the total um, energy generation, uh, electricity generation in the UK, and um, uh, of the green energy, and uh, less than 2% of the total. But as you can see, other parts of this renewable industry is uh, expanding much more rapidly uh, in terms of the actual output, whereas, of course, as you've just seen, there has been an explosive growth in the number of, of uh, small uh, hydropower stations, but it's not having the same sort of proportional effect on the productivity. <clears throat> you've heard a bit about the, the River Froome, where we are based. Um, earlier today, we are the most westerly chalk stream. Um, down on the south coast, about as far away in England as you can get almost uh, from here. Um, and in 2010, one of these low head uh, hydro uh, turbines, an Archimedes screw, was installed. <clears throat> this, I believe, is a fairly classical uh, hydro uh, Archimedes screw. It's got three blades, um, it's got a diameter of 2.2 meters, and its max capacity is uh, 16 kilowatts. It's not very much. And um, to put that into perspective, if it was producing at its max capacity throughout the year, that would be the equivalent of the electricity consumption of about 30 to 40 houses in the UK. And even in a relatively stable flow regime like a chalk stream, it's not running at max capacity all the time, far from it. At times there's not enough water for it to run at all. Uh, and at times there's actually too much water for some design reason they can't run when their water levels are too high. So I'm sort of putting my neck out and saying maybe it provides energy for 10, maybe max 20 houses. So yeah, it is, it is, it is contributing, but you know, small beer. They have a fist-friendly reputation, these Archimedes screws. And as you'll notice in this picture here, um, there is actually currently no regulation in terms of saying that there has to be a screen in front of these uh, Archimedes screws. So you'll see a screen here, but it's a very coarse screen, and it's basically just to filter out large debris coming down river. Fish can easily, can freely migrate into the turbine hot uh, and down the, tur down the screw here. <clears throat> now, what it does have uh, to sort of mitigate against the fish that does make that, take that route is that it has a rubber uh, leading edge on, on the blade. So should there be a bleed blade struck, I mean, it's, it's not pure metal, I suppose. Most of the studies of these in the past have focused on, on what is the impact catching the fish basically just as they come out the turbine. Andy mentioned a little bit about that earlier, scale loss, etc. However, it's, it's a bit more difficult to, to sort of to follow um, the fate when they go further on. And it has been reported from the sort of classic hydropower stations that's quite a pro significant proportion of the mortality and um, occurs later on, so there's sort of a delayed effect. So maybe looking at them immediately downstream uh, of the turbine itself is, is not giving us the full picture. So the installation of this, uh, this hydro turbine at Bindon Mill provided an opportunity for us. And why did it provide an opportunity for us? It's because our uh, research center is based here at East Stoke, which is about three and a half kilometers the river flows downstream from Bindon Mill. We've heard about pit tags already. And we electrofished more or less the entire catchment in September. And there, but the aim is to tag about 10,000 power. And most years, we achieve that. And 10,000 power in September on the River Froome equates to about 10% of the population. And it's important here to reiterate that the Froome salmon population is a simple one. 
we only 98% of our small size ones, so to use a not so nice uh, analogy, the toilet flushes every year. Um, uh, yeah, pit tags, what do they do? Well, they provide us with a uh, unique identifier for the individuals. And one of the nice things about pit tags is that they stay with the fish for life. They don't carry a battery, hence as long as the glass capsule around the tag itself stays intact, well, then the tag will stay alive. So we'll be able to detect that individual uh, throughout its life. Schematically, the turbine at Binden got the flow coming from left to what's right. You got three routes that the fish can, can take around the, the, uh, around the turbine area. There's the main hatches, which takes the majority of the flow. Then there's the turbine, tur turbine entrance, and you got a fish pass. And what we did was we established, when, when the, the turbine was installed, we uh, established a partnership with the Environment Agency, and they footed part of the bill for installing pit tag antenna on all these three routes. So, what we can do now is, because we know what individuals uses what route, we can look at their fate as they reach East Stoke, depending on route taken. 2015 was the first year that this system was up and run, pro running properly. And uh, in that year, we detected 583 salmon smolts going past Binden. 180 of these uh, went the turbine route, and 403 chose one of the other two routes. And it's important to mention that all these tags were only detected at one station, so we're pretty certain that that station that they were detected at was actually the route and the only route that, that those individuals used. It was a very unidirectional movement. And the other thing I'll, flag, the thing I'll flag up here is acoustic technology, radio technology provides some fantastic opportunities, but obviously there is a price to pay for that where the price of those tags are in the hundreds. Our pit tags are $2 a pop. So sample size matters. Now a little play with numbers here, not hugely important. You see it's about 30% of the tags were detected behind the turbine, having used the turbine route. If we do a little play with numbers, we know from the systems at East Oak that Bindon that year operated at 71%. If we then play with them, say those 29% that we didn't see, we know they passed Bindon. If they all went the turbine route, well then 51% went the turbine route. And if they all went other routes, 22. It's not really that significant in, in a bigger scale of things. What's the take home message really is a significant proportion of the fish use the turbine route. And the other take home message is that of course that will very much depend on local conditions, which what proportion of the fish will use what route. <clears throat> but yeah, significant numbers went through the, the washing machine. Um, if we look at the probability of transition to East Stoke, then you'll see that uh, we oh, so, um, that 91 percent of the individuals that were detected at the turbine were redetected at East Oak, and 92 percent used other routes were redetected there. It's important to emphasize that these are not actual survival measures because none of these telemetry systems are 100 percent efficient. So it's not. It just tells us that there was a very high probability of survival and there was no effect on going through the turbine on this medium term basis. Basically, the same proportion of the fish using the turbine route as other routes made it down to East Stoke. If we look at the transition time, well, then we'll see the majority of, uh, of our smolts made a rapid transition and 35% made the transition, the three and a half kilometer transition within three hours and Nearly 90% did it within 24 hours, and, and lo and behold, again, we're here to illustrate. The blue is the fish using other routes, and red using the turbine. And again, there was no significant difference in the transition time between cho route choice. Yeah, if I speed up, I probably have time for this. Now, what you see here is our original pit tag readers that we installed behind the reader. These boxes here now, they're probably the most expensive raised beds for growing herbs in the UK now. Useless they were, they didn't work. So, 
Um, but what I really, the point I want to make here is that what we, we tried to sort of rescue things. And what we did was we took some of the fish we caught in our rotary screw trap at East Oak. We tagged them, transferred them up to Binden, popped half of them down uh, the turbine route at the point of no return and half of them down the hatch route at point of no return and looked at the same measures. Sort of take home, uh, this message was the same here. The probability of reaching East Stoke was the same, depend, no matter what route for these experimental fish, and also there was no significant difference in the time. But what I really wanted to say with this, with, with including this bit of data, is that if you compare that data, the transition probability um, for the, from the sort of newly tagged fish this, with the ones that have been tagged half year previous, and we're probably exhibiting, shall we say, a more normal, more natural migration behavior, then you see there's significant difference in the numbers there in terms of what, how likely they were to reach East Stoke and the same for the transition time. Quite big differences there. So sort of the take home message of that really is we need to give the fish time, uh, we need to give the fish an opportunity to recover from, to recover from our handling. Uh, and of course, if you're using things like uh, um, a radio or acoustic tags, you, you don't have the luxury of tagging them half a year ahead. Um, but, you know, keep it in mind, give them time to recover. They didn't really have much time to recover in their natural environment in this experiment, and it probably reflects in the results. Now, there's been a lot of talk about delays around these uh, systems today, too, and it has been well um, established around classic hydro dams. Um, and I just want to involve another little study that uh, we did uh, together with uh, Andy Moore, uh, where we looked at, uh, acoustically, Andy introduced this earlier. And basically what I want to show you here is that we had receivers around Binden, we had many of them, but the two of them I want to focus on here is one we had 200 meters upstream of the, of the hatches in the turbine, and another one 200 meters downstream. And if we look at the transition time of the individuals that was uh, detected on both of the, these, which were 50, and these are trout smolts. Um, uh, there were 50 individuals who detected at both. And if we look at the median um, migration speed of those 50 individuals, then it was 82 kilometers per day. Um, I think 90% of them did it within 15 minutes, and, and uh, all but two did it within uh, an hour. And uh, if we look at the rest of the freshwater section of the river and these tags, uh, then it's clear that the migration speed uh, around this installation wasn't any different to the rest of the freshwater zone. Now again, I'll point out, this is for the specific conditions around this installation. It's not necessarily applicable to all installations, but here, definitely, there wasn't any delay that we were able to detect in terms of choosing a route here. Now, the last one uh, slide I want to show here is sort of fresh from the press. You will have noticed that I talked about smolts in 2015, and I talked about these tags staying with the fish for life. So, of course, when they return again as adults, um, we're able to detect them again. And uh, because we know what individuals chose what route, we'll be able, to, we'll be able to look at marine survival, because there is Andy touched on that earlier too. S scale loss which is, a very, is a very real risk, even if they don't get struck by the blade, just uh, going through the drum. Very high um, risk of losing scales. And it, it is, is, it's, it's quite plausible that an effect of that would only take place when, when, when they enter the salt water. So, so we have here sort of a long-term um, results in that. Now numbers obviously reduce when you have to have a, a, a marine survival of about 5%, but basically here, if we look at the grills from last year, then you see 13 of the turbine fish. Uh, so 7% of them came back, and 5% of the fish that used other routes uh, came back. So again, no difference. Um, and really, that's, that's as far as you can take it. Now, regarding this marine part of the cycle, uh, obviously these are these are low numbers, so let, let's, let's have a couple of more years of marine returns before we can really, really start <clears throat> talking with, uh, with confidence about whether there is a difference or not, but clearly these numbers indicate that there isn't. Um, 
case in order to conclude, small definitely used the turbine route. Um, there was no effect on the transition probability to e -stop, and there was also no effect on the transition time taken to, trans to migrate the three and a half kilometers. It was clear from the, the, the sort of little experiment we did when we were panicking that, yeah, you know, you've got to think about it when you handle these fish and the effects that you're having on their behavior and how you interpret the results you get from that. Today we're here only to talk about kelts. There are, of course, other fish that use this route. Migrating upstream through these are, are impossible, but obviously other, other uh, um, animals that migrate downstream, they, they can potentially face it. And uh, silver eels and uh, kelts are cla would be examples of that. And I would imagine that the, the blade strike risk would increase with the length of the, the fish, so maybe. They are, they are at a high, higher risk category. I don't know. Um, and uh, to reiterate, you know, this has been the mill specific. I think the turbine we got there, the actual Archimedes screw, is probably pretty standard. There might be slightly bigger sizes of them in other places and smaller, etc. But, you know, uh, the results here are for Binden Mill and, and, and how that works there. And the last one, a uh, little point I want to put up here is, and it is not really to be uh, to sort of uh, uh, have a dick at anybody or anything, or, but um, connectivity. We shouldn't forget that, yes, it looks like these smolts, they're not hugely impacted by this. But having these weir structures there, they still disrupt the connectivity of our systems. And it's not just for someone, someone it's for any other animal that wants to migrate that system. And, oh, that's come up a bit weird. Um, as part of the five point approach that the Environment Agency has launched for the salmon uh, in, in England, uh, the th point three of that is to remove barriers to migration and to an enhance habitat. And what I'll say is that there is sort of slight conflict and maybe having to weigh up. What's the gain of, of these uh, renewable energies uh, compared to what are the potential negative eco uh, ecological um, um, impacts thereof? And the other thing is, once you've installed one of these hydro turbines at an existing weir structure, you're probably less likely to remove that weir structure, uh, or more likely to meet more resistance, therefore. There were the words.